Sumeru, also known as the Land of Wisdom and Dendro, is the next region that will be added to Genshin Impact. In fact, it is only one update away from the release of this video, so I thought it would be a good time to go over everything and review everything we know about this region. In this video, I'll dive into the locations, characters, story, and other miscellaneous bits of knowledge we have. This video will have no information from any of the leaks going around right now, so if you're avoiding those, don't worry, there's none here. Everything here is just information from the game or official media, plus a few of my own little thoughts and theories on certain subjects. Also, if you like this video, consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot, and I'd really appreciate it. Anyways, let's move right on and get into the video. While we don't know the names of many locations in Sumeru besides the Academia, we do get a glimpse at a few different areas in the preview for Sumeru that was shown during the version 2.8 special program. This preview shows the mostly lush forest and jungle part of Sumeru, which leads me to believe that we won't get the desert section right away, but rather in version 3.1 or 3.2. The jungle area does look very lush and vibrant though, with bright flowers and many different types of trees being seen throughout the teaser. This jungle area will be very interesting to explore, as we haven't had too many big forest areas with little space between the trees, besides a few small areas like Wolvendom in Mondstadt or Chinju Forest in Inazuma. Now, the one area of Sumeru that we do know the name of is the Sumeru Academia. However, I don't think it appears in this trailer. It may be this building on screen behind the trees towards the end of the teaser, but I think that the Academia would be much bigger than this, as that building looks rather small. Moving on to the next clip of the teaser, we can see a bunch of houses and buildings that are built on a big tree. This makes me wonder if we would see the entire main city of Sumeru in a giant tree, maybe even bigger than the one here. The houses shown in the next clip may also be located on this tree. I really like the design of these houses, as they look to be made of leaves and they all have really pretty flowers. I'd honestly like to vacation in one of them if I could. Anyways, moving on to the next clip, we see a few buildings and stands along with a teleport waypoint. These stands remind me of a bazaar, albeit a small one. In this clip, you can also see the roots of what appears to be a giant tree located above the houses. This could be the same tree as earlier in the teaser, but I don't see any stone pathways towards the bottom of that tree or roots that are that big. So, it may be that the entire main city of Sumeru is on a giant tree like I said, which would be pretty cool. Anyways, moving on to the next clip, we can see this very pretty lighthouse, with some docks and a couple boats as well. The trees around it are also super pretty, and I can't wait to see how this area looks at night. In the background to the left, you can also see what looks like a few Inazuman islands, but they do look pretty far away. Still, I'm wondering if we'll travel from Inazuma to Sumeru by boat, with this lighthouse area being where we're dropped off. The next clip is just a view of some plants from below. I'm no expert on plants, but to me, these look like they grow in or near water. They're also quite massive, even being taller than the ledges on the side while also blocking the sun out. This combined with the big trees from earlier, makes me wonder how many giant plants we'll be getting in Sumeru. Now, for this next clip, I was confused at first as to why Sumeru would need a greenhouse, as it is the land of Dendro. You can even see the same flowers that are in the center of this greenhouse in the opening shot of this teaser, which is making me wonder even more why this greenhouse is here. The plants in the center of this greenhouse do seem to have some mysterious aura around them though, so perhaps these plants in particular are somehow connected to Lesser Lord Kusanali, or even the God of the Woods. There also appears to be a modified Ruin Sentinel over to the right side of the screen. It would be very cool if the scholars of Sumeru were able to transform these machines and use them for their own benefit. Speaking of Ruin Machines, in the next clip, we see what are perhaps the remnants of a giant Ruin Machine that was destroyed at some point, and over time became overgrown with plant life. 
I had mentioned on Twitter a few weeks back that perhaps this giant machine is what killed the god of the woods, or perhaps they had to sacrifice themselves to save Sumeru from this alien machine. Now in this next clip, we can see a little village full of plant life, with a newer looking building just behind the trees. This could be the Sumeru Academia, but like I mentioned earlier, it looks too small to me to be the Academia. However, this could just be a result of it being mostly hidden behind the trees, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see on that. And now we've reached the final clip of this teaser. There are a few things I want to discuss about this clip, starting with the Statue of the Seven. As you can see, the statue shows Lesser Lord Kusanali on a leafy throne, leaning on the glowing orb with her legs either crossed or tucked up so her knees also reach the orb. It shows that she'll probably have a child model, much like Klee or Chi Chi. This also proves that the Statues of the Seven change when a new Archon rises to power. While we aren't sure if it is an automatic process or if Celestia replaces the old statues with new ones, this does show that the statues don't represent the Archons who won the Archon War. It also makes me wonder if we'll be able to find a statue of the Seven somewhere that shows the God of the Woods, perhaps hidden underground somewhere. It is also possible that one of these statues could be located in the desert that is shown in the background of this clip. Like I said earlier, this desert area might not be released until 3.1 or even 3.2, but there are a few pieces of it that we can see from this teaser. Firstly, it seems the mountains of Sumeru seem to dip down from their tall peaks on the right to the valley of a desert on the left, so the transition is more subtle and not right away. There also appears to be a few rocky mountains at the edge of the desert, compared to the more lush and vibrant ones on the jungle. In the desert, you can also see what look like dead and wilted trees with no leaves, just the stem remaining. I had seen a few people talking about the idea that this may be the result of the God of the Woods dying, with the plant life slowly dying throughout Sumeru as well. This may also be the reason why the greenhouse seen earlier was constructed, and perhaps the efforts worked and Sumeru was saved. On the contrary, the desert may be expanding, and we may have to help stop it. But before we get into the story, I think it's time to dive into the playable characters from Sumeru that we know about. So, let's get right into that. Let's start off this section with the first character we learned about from Sumeru, that being Sino, who is shown all the way back in the Travail trailer. While we don't know his element yet, we do know that he wields a polearm, as seen in the trailer. It is also not confirmed whether the gem on his belt is a vision or not, but going by the designs of the other Sumeru characters, it looks like it may just be a regular gem. Sino also appeared in the manga, where it was stated that he was a scholar from Sumeru Academia, and a friend of Lisa's, who also studied at the Academia for a time. He also seems to be extremely powerful, being able to perform a spell that suppressed Kali's Archon Residue, making me think he is very likely to be a 5-star character. Speaking of Kali, she has been revealed as a playable character for version 3.0. She has definitely grown up since her appearance in the manga, now being taller with longer hair. She also now possesses the Dendro Vision and wields a bow. There are also two pieces of fabric hanging off from her vision, much like how Amber has a feather off hers, and the fabrics even match the style of Amber's bunny ear bow. We also first met Kali in the manga, and she was very different from how she is now. Back then, she was very sick, especially due to having being infused with Archon Residue, thanks to the Fatui Harbinger de Torre. Eventually though, with the help of Sino, Amber, and the other knights of Vonius, she was able to have her Archon Residue sealed away, it would then leave for Sumeru with Sino. That's just a very brief summary of the manga though, so I recommend you read that before Sumeru releases. The next character for version 3.0 also happens to have a Dendro Vision, that being Tainari. He appears to be based off a Fennec Fox, as seen with his ears. The Fennec Fox is a tiny fox that is native to the regions of Northern Africa, and it has unusually big ears that it uses to dissipate heat and listen for prey underground. He is a forest ranger in Sumeru, and he appears to have the medium male model. As for his weapon, I'm not sure what it could be. 
He looks like he could be holding a catalyst, but there are plenty of characters who have objects that they use that aren't catalysts, like Ganyu's flower with her elemental skill or Hu Tao's ghost with her elemental burst, just to name a few. The next and final character for version 3.0 is Dori. She wields an electrovision, being the only character in 3.0 who doesn't have a dendrovision. She also appears to have a female child model, being the first new character with this model since Sayu all the way back in version 2.0. However, it seems that Lesser Lord Kusanali will probably join this club soon after her. Anyways, Dori's design seems to be based on a genie. The big hat as well as the floofy sleeves and pants make her seem mystical and mysterious, so perhaps there's more going on with her than we know. She also has some star patterns in her design, making me think she definitely knows more than she lets on. Now, the next character is Lesser Lord Kusanali, or the Dendro Archon. While we haven't seen her model, we have seen a depiction of her, that being the Statue of the Seven of Sumeru. Like I mentioned earlier, she appears to have a female child model, and will of course wield the element of Dendro, as she is the Archon of that element after all. Being the Dendro Archon, Kusanali will definitely be important to the main story of Sumeru. She is also the god of wisdom, so we'll probably learn a great deal about many different things from her. She is also the youngest of the seven, being only 500 years old, meaning she was born around the time of the Cataclysm. Either way, she'll be very important to the big picture. Now, before we go on to talking about the story, I'd like to briefly mention one more potential character. That character is none other than Scaramouche. Due to the fact that he has been mentioned in voice lines from both Ryan Shogun and Yaimiko, I believe that he may be playable very soon and might have a role in Sumeru's story. Though I am wondering if he'll use the Electronosis, or if he'll somehow be granted a vision sometime during the Sumeru Archon quests. Either way, I think he will be very important to Sumeru's stories as well. So, speaking of the story, let's move on and talk about what we know about what's happening in Sumeru, and what we know about the overall story here. Let's start off this section by discussing the Travail trailer. In this trailer, each region is teased with a character or two from each, who as I mentioned earlier was Sino from Sumeru. It also provides the name of the Archon quest, a narration from Danesleaf, and a phrase at the bottom. This phrase is written into Vat's Latin script, meaning it can be translated from the symbols to Latin, then Latin to English. The phrase for Sumeru reads in Latin as Sub Florius Lumen Sagicitis, which when translated to English reads as Under the Flowery Light of Sagicity. This references Lesser Lord Kusanali being known as the God of Wisdom, like a sage, but also references her alternative title as the Flower Archon. As for the title of this Archon quest, it is Truth Amongst the Pages of Piranha. I've said this in some of my other videos regarding Sumeru, but Piranha is a class of Sanskrit and Hindu writings containing various legends and folklore. It can also be directly translated from Sanskrit to mean ancient, thus making the title Truth Amongst the Pages of the Ancients. Combining this title with the death of the god of the woods during the Cataclysm, the giant ruin machine seen in the Sumeru teaser, and Sumeru's current archon being the god of wisdom, I feel as though we may learn a great deal about Conria, the Cataclysm, and even Celestia itself throughout these archon quests. However, the topic of Celestia seems to be taboo in Sumeru, especially given Danesleaf dialogue in the Travail trailer. The god of wisdom's enemy is wisdom itself, and the oasis of knowledge is a mirage in the desert of ignorance. In the city of scholars, there is a push for folly, yet the god of wisdom makes no argument against it. I would like to say that I think the topic of Celestia, and more specifically their role in the Cataclysm, will be big in the Sumeru Archon quests. Anyways, during the fifth, and as of this recording latest, run of the Marvelous Merchandise event, Lieben gives us some information regarding Sumeru. He says that he went there sometime prior to the event, but he quickly left after seeing some strange folks arriving in Sumeru. He said he felt an ominous air about them, and that the nation has taken a turn for the worse recently, 
and so he left. He even warned the Traveler not to go to Sumeru, vaguely suggesting they go to Fontaine instead, even referencing Liyue's Chowing village, which is the gateway to Fontaine. Of course, we are still going to Sumeru, and we'll be able to figure out who these ominous folks are soon enough. In my opinion, they may be the Fatui, but I'll be talking more about them at the end of this section. For now, I'd like to touch on the God of the Woods, and how they may have some importance in the story. As I've mentioned earlier, the God of the Woods is dead, as they were slain during the Catechism 500 years ago. However, they most likely will have some influence in the Archon Quests, as I've discussed in my video on the God of the Woods. It could just be an influence caused by their death, much like how Raiden A was influenced to further pursue her ideals of eternity after the death of her sister Raiden Makoto, and later on the supposed death of the Geo Archon Morax. Then again, Lesser Lord Kusanali may not have even been alive during the time the God of the Woods died, as it said she was 500 years old, and it's not stated if she was born before or after the Cataclysm. Even so, I believe that the God of the Woods would have some influence in these Archon quests, and I'm thinking it'll be something direct. Perhaps clues they left behind in hidden codes may be only a way that a powerful Dendro wielder could comprehend, which would leave both Lesser Lord Kusanali, or even the Traveler themselves. Anyways, I'd now like to bring up a character that isn't from Simru, but rather from Mondstadt. This character is none other than the Librarian Lisa of the Knights of Favonius. The reason I'm bringing her up is because she once studied at the Simru Academia, but left after becoming disillusioned with what she witnessed. As for what she saw, her fifth character story says that she witnessed raving mad scholars and uninhibited erudition. She decided that the price to pay for gaining a lot of knowledge was too much, and thus left to return to Mondstadt. This is also the reason why Lisa doesn't take many things too seriously, causing some people to think of her as lazy. Now, as for this price of knowledge, I feel as though it will have some sort of role in Sumeru as well. Earlier in this video, I had mentioned that I believe the topic of Celestia and the Cataclysm will be a big one throughout these Archon quests, especially given the death of the God of the Woods during the Cataclysm and the birth of Lesser Lord Kusanali. Combining this with the line Dainsleaf says about the push for folly in the Travail trailer, the consequences for going against Celestia or learning their secrets would be pretty severe. So perhaps Lesser Lord Kusanali or the Sages are trying to prevent people from knowing about it. While knowledge is good, having too much of it could end badly. Also, Celestia doesn't seem to take kindly to civilizations learning more about them. Dragonspine went from a prosperous and luscious mountain to a cold and barren peak. The chasm now leaks mysterious ooze all over the place, which may be a direct result of the celestial nail there. And of course, the serpent god of Watatsumi, or Abashi, was ordered to be slain by the Electro Archon after learning the truth that Celestia came from beyond to that. Continuing on the topic of the Sumeru Academia though, its fields of study are divided into six groups, four of which we know. The first is Spantamad, or Amati, which specializes in studying the elements and ley lines. The second is Haravatat, which specializes in studying ancient runes. The third is Amurta, and likely relates to ecology and plant life. And the fourth and final one we know of is Kashrawar, which is possibly related to geology. There are also many different levels of progression of titles for the Sumeru Academia. The first is the Driosh, who are traveling scholars who go out in the world to learn and write a thesis as part of their review process for graduation. The next is the Dalster, who have passed two theses through the review process. Third is the Herbad, who are researchers of high prestige who hold great knowledge. And the highest level is of course the Sages, who are rather powerful scholars who possess very high ranks in the academia. Moving on though, I would now like to discuss a group from Sumeru known as the Eremite. We first learn of the Eremite from Sumida in the Through the Mists World Quest series, where they are listed among a group of other adventurer or warrior groups. In fact, they are known as mercenaries who travel to Vat. 
We later learn more about them from Zhishong in Nazafarin, the former describing them as people who are not afraid of dying so they might truly live. As for Nazafarin, she describes them as wielding bizarre yet formidable powers, but also finds the subject rather uncomfortable to talk about, and thus drops it rather soon after. These lines make me think they might wield some sort of magic, maybe even somehow having delusions. This would line up with the thought that they aren't afraid of dying so they might truly live, with the truly live part representing their ambitions. It would also explain the bizarre yet formidable powers, as delusions are strong weapons, but not many of the common folk understand or even know about them. Speaking of delusions, I'd also like to touch upon the Fatui, of course. The Fatui, usually along with one or more Harbingers, always have had a presence in every region's Archon quests up to this point. Signora and Mondstadt, Child and Signora and Liyue, and Scaramouche and Signora and Inazuma. As for who we'll see in Sumeru, I have two Harbingers in mind. The first is Scaramouche, as his story is left unfinished in the Inazuma Archon quests and a few subsequent events. I have mentioned in multiple videos before that I believe he will go to the God of Wisdom to learn more about the Gnosis he possesses, and I still believe that to be a very realistic possibility. For the other Harbinger, I think Tatori might finally make his in-game appearance in Sumeru. He is another character who was first introduced in the manga, and he is basically a mad scientist who once attended the Sumeru Academia. However, one day, he was approached by Piero, the first of the Harbingers, and was asked to join the Vitui as a Harbinger, being granted the ironic title of Doctor, or Dottore. I believe it would make perfect sense for Dottore to return to Sumeru, not only to retrieve the Dendronosis, but also possibly the Electronosis from Scaramouche. He was most likely the one to unlock Scaramouche's true potential as the creation of an Archon, so he would likely want to check up on his work. Additionally, Kali is also known to be in Sumeru, and is going to be playable, so I believe Tatori may return to check on her too, or he might just not care. Kali currently has an amount of Archon residue inside her, which was the result of Tatori's experiments on her, and it was eventually sealed by Sino. It does still remain inside her though, it was not eliminated. Also, as I mentioned earlier, Liebin said there were some strange folks who arrived in Sumeru who have an ominous aura about them. Like I said, I believe he is referencing the Fatui here, and from his dialogue, they may have a very big presence in Sumeru, and may be planning something big as well. I do have one last thing to mention about the Fatui before we move on, and that is about the 8th Harbinger, La Senora. While of course she was slain by the Electro Archon, I feel as though we could learn more about her in Sumeru, as she also once attended the Academia. I have a video planned on her a few weeks down the line, so I'll get more into that then. Now, there are a lot more things to discuss about Sumeru, including events, specialties, and non-playable characters we've met, among other things. They're all a bit too small to have their own individual sections, so I've combined them into one miscellaneous section. So now, let's dive right into that. Let's start off this final section with some events we may see throughout our time in Sumeru. All the way back during version 1.4's Windbloom Festival, the Sumeru scholar Syed told us about a festival that occurs yearly in Sumeru. This festival is the Sabzirus Festival, and it celebrates the birth of Lesser Lord Kusanali. I'm thinking this event would occur sometime after we finish the Sumeru Archon quests, perhaps during version 3.3 or 3.4. It all really depends on when Lesser Lord Kusanali's birthday falls, as it will probably align with the date in real life as well. It could also play a part in the Archon quests, but festivals like these are usually reserved for events, so we'll just have to wait and see. As for other types of events we could see, I'm thinking more of the events that involve mechanisms like Aisha's Chaos Prospector or Persina's Spikes, both originally from version 2.2. These devices were created by scholars of Sumer Academia after all, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if we get an event revolving around these here. 
I would also like to see a rerun of the Lost Riches event from versions 1.2 and 2.0, as well as a new Sealy color to go along with it, of course. We'll also most likely get reruns of events such as the ones where they give a limited number of double drops for talent book domains and ley lines throughout the week. Moving on from events though, like other regions, Sumeru of course has its own specialties. According to Zhang Li during the Liyue Archon quests, Sumeru has its own specialty wine, that being frigid steak wine. However, he prefers Mondstadt's dandelion wine that Venti would often bring to him after the Archon War. As the Traveler isn't allowed to drink, I guess we'll just have to take his word for it. Now, we have seen many mechanical inventions that have originated from Sumeru, including Aisha's Chaos Prospector, Persina's Spikes, and the modified Ruin Sentinels seen in the greenhouse in the Sumeru teaser. All of these mechanisms seem to be based on Kanri and Tech, which is very interesting considering they originate from Sumeru. Perhaps the sages of Sumeru have so much power and knowledge that they were able to reverse engineer the tech of Kanria, most likely from that giant ruin machine that was also shown in the Sumeru teaser, and used it to create technology for themselves. This could be a very dangerous game to play though. Kanria was destroyed by Celestia, and if Sumeru is using Kanrian technology, then things might not end well for them. Perhaps the technology itself is not necessarily a crime, but the way it's used is. Thus, Lesser Lord Kusanali and the Sages might push for folly for this topic specifically, in order to make sure that people don't use technology against the wishes of Celestia. Now, I'd like to go over NPCs we've met from Sumeru throughout our travels in Mondstadt, Liyue, and Inazuma. Syed is a researcher who was found in the church courtyard in Mondstadt, and was the one who also told the Traveler about the Sabzeros festival that takes place every year in Sumeru. Soraya is a researcher located at Wangshu Inn, but is originally found in the Guili Plains in order to start the world quest Treasure Lost, Treasure Found. She holds an interest in Liyue, specifically in Guizhong, the god of dust. Alrani is her fellow archaeologist who was originally in Liyue, but then travels to Inazuma to try and gain a new topic for her thesis. Hosanai is an event-exclusive NPC, who gives us information on Aisha's Chaos Prospector and Persina's Spikes, among other inventions. The inventors of these devices, Aisha and Persina, were also from Simuru. While their current statuses are unknown, they are most likely historical figures who we won't meet. Vahid is one of the shopkeepers in Rito, and promotes the Anahitian blessing of Lesser Lord Kusunali. Parvana is also an Inazuma, as a member of the Gourmet Supremos trio. Anisa and Kaushik are both in Inazuma as well, located on Watatsumi Island. Anisa is trained to be a daster, while Kaushik is researching the culture and history of the island. Khadiv is an ecologist, and is also part of the Chasm Exploration Team. On top of this, he is also a descendant of Persina, creator of Persina's Spikes, which is why I believe she is a historical figure. Nazafarin is a friend of Parvana, who traveled to Liyue during the Spices of the West events in order to get taste testers for a seasoning that would bring happiness to all people who try it. The final two NPCs from Sumeru are ones we haven't actually met, as they are instead authors of books we've seen in games instead. Fadalan is the author of the book Customs of Liyue, while Masudi is the author of Yakshas, the Guardian Adepti. We may meet them eventually, perhaps in Sumeru. Anyways, there is one more thing I'd like to discuss before I finish up this video, that being the exploration mechanics. At the very beginning of the Sumeru teaser, in the bottom left corner of the screen, you can see a Sealy Court with a green Sealy sitting inside. This is most likely a brand new Dendro Sealy, like the Electro Sealies we got in Inazuma. As for how these Sealies would work, perhaps they might burrow under the ground like a Dendro Slime, meaning we might have to go around finding them, which would allow them to move on to the next spot. While this might be a little annoying, Sumeru's god is the god of wisdom after all, so the puzzles will probably be a bit more challenging and require more patience and wit. There will also be Dendrograna, 
which may also have a system to be upgraded like the Electrograna in Azuma. Perhaps one of these upgrades could be to help better find the Dendrocelis hidden in the ground, or granting the ability to solve more complicated puzzles. This might mean that there could also be another tree to level up like the Frostbearing Tree in Dragonspine or the Sacred Sakura in Azuma. This new tree is what we could also offer the new Dendro Sigils to. And finally, there will also of course be Dendroculi scattered throughout Sumeru. Each region has always had more than the last of their respective oculi, so Sumeru will most likely have a lot. Mondstadt has 66 animoculi, Liyue has 131 geoculi, and Inazuma has 181 electroculi. Going by this logic, there could be over 200 dendroculi scattered throughout Sumeru when the region is fully released. Now, this was going to be the end of the video here, but right before I could get to recording, a new Sumeru teaser was dropped, this time focusing on the dendro element. So before the end, I'll briefly go over this new teaser and what we saw here, including new dendro reactions. First off, we get to see the Traveler in action in their dendro-aligned state for the first time. They are seen fighting against a group of enemies that seem to be similar to the Treasure Hoarders. Based on the color of their clothing, they could be a different group of enemies, but could also just be a faction of the Treasure Hoarders more accustomed to fighting in the rainforests and deserts of Sumeru. These could even be the Aramite enemies. We then get to see an object summoned by the Dendro Traveler, which may be due to their elemental burst. We then see them bounce on a mushroom, which can react with Pyro, Electro, or Hydro to change how it looks and how it acts. We also get to see them fly through the air, presumably using Dendrograna. We can also see them use their elemental skill, which just looks to be a slash that launches a wave of Dendro damage. Next, we get a glimpse at one of the new world bosses coming in version 3.0, that being the Electro Regisvine. We haven't had a new Regisvine since the game came out almost two years ago, so it's really cool to see another one. From what we see, we can guess that it might have a similar attack pattern to the other Regisvines, but we aren't sure of its health and actual skills just yet. Next, we get information about the two new elemental reactions coming to the game in version 3.0. The first is Bloom, which is made when Dendro reacts with Hydro. The second is Catalyze, which is made when Dendro reacts with Electro. This means we now have three Dendro reactions, as we've had Burning, which is Dendro and Pyro, since launch. It is also shown that the objects dropped from the Bloom reaction, and maybe the reactions themselves, can further react with some other elements to either explode or shoot back in an enemy. Later in the trailer, we can also see what a dendro floating fungus looks like, meaning we might get variants of the floating fungus for each element. Overall, this latest teaser shows a lot of the exploration portion of Sumeru 2, showing how we'll have to jump on bouncy mushrooms to explore the treetops, and use elemental reactions even while exploring, which is really cool. If more teasers get released after this one, I won't be able to cover them in this video, but I'll still try to talk about them on Twitter. There's a lot to anticipate with Sumeru, and with how much we know about it, there are probably a few things I missed, but this video is already super long as is. If I did miss anything, please let me know down in the comments below, and feel free to share your thoughts about Sumeru too, I'd love to hear them. Anyways, that's it for this video, thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have an amazing day, and I'll see you all in the next video.